Roman numeral three, James and Rose presidency, or also known as the era of good feelings. So before we start this lecture, let's think back about our last lecture. We had talked about the presidency of James Madison and the War of 1812. And if you remember, in the War of 1812, one of the consequences of the War of 1812 was that the Federalist Party, for the most part, is going to disintegrate. Um, because of their opposition to the war and the outcome of the war being successful for the Democratic Republicans, we see that the Federalist Party is going to go away. And so now we have a time in American history where we have a presidency where there's really only one political party in America. That's the Democratic Republicans. And so hence the name, the Era of Good Feelings. Americans emerged from the War of 1812 um, with only one political party, so they thought all the, the partisan rancor of the past administrations would be gone. We could all be united now, since there's only one political party. And we also feel very proud of ourselves. There's lots of nationalism in America. We've just defeated the British for the second time. The future looks bright for America. Um, we finally have gotten the British off, uh, off out, the, out of the West. Uh, we've conquered the Native American threat out West things look like they're gonna be amazing for us. And so the reason there's a question mark there is we'll find out, was it really an era of good feelings? Is that a good name for this time in American history? And the era of good feelings really just encapsulates Monroe's presidency. So let's talk about the West since I just mentioned it. So it says expansion and slavery, 1817 to 1825. These two topics, expansion West and slavery are linked indelibly in American history. Um, as we move West, you know, the question is, who moves west, and what do they take with them? If you're a northerner and you don't have slavery, um, you were going to see that people, as they settle the, the, the uh, northwest, the northwest territory, um, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, those kinds of places, they're not bringing slaves with them, and so um, we see that there won't be slavery growing in the northwest. However, after the War of 1812, we're going to see that people are free to move west because the Indian threat, as it says in the slide there, loss of Indian threat is gone after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And so people are going to be moving west from Carol the Carolinas and Georgia and Virginia, and they're going to be taking their slaves with them. And so slavery will grow west. So let's talk about that this idea of moving west. Why would people be moving west after 1817? Well, the first one, as I put there, is it's in bold print, is there's the loss of Indian threat. After the War of 1812, U.S. forces had dealt a devastating defeat to Native Americans in the northwest at the Battle of Thames and Tippecanoe, and then in the southwest with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And so for the most part, large-scale organized Native resistance against white America moving west is going to be much less of a threat, and so it's easier to move west without having to worry about Native American attacks. Next, we see internal improvements. We'll talk about the United States government starting to build uh, roads and turnpikes, and then soon canals out west, and it just makes it easier for people to get west by this, this round of internal improvements the United States is going to be creating. Next, we see immigration. After the war is over, immigration is going to pick up again. Um, and so as people move into the United States, there's, either, there's going to be more population pressure, and so there's more people, and so people will move west because of that. Next, land exhaustion. Especially in the South, Southerners in Virginia and North Carolina, they grow tobacco, and tobacco is very ruinous of the soil. It sucks up a lot of the nutrients in the soil, and without modern chemicals, um, fertilizers, we see that there's this constant need for more land out west. And so that's going to be pushing people, at least in the south, to move out west. Next, the Industrial Revolution is starting in England. And one of the first industries that is really impacted by the Industrial Revolution in England is the textile industry, making clothes out of cotton. And so we see that now the ascendancy of a new crop in America, or oh, around 1800, um, and then a little bit before that, 1793, with the invention of the cotton gin, Americans are going to be making a lot more cotton because there's a huge market for it in Britain. Uh, the textile mills in Britain have an insatiable demand for American cotton, and so there's more land out west, so let's go get that land so we can meet this British demand for cotton. And then the last one we say, embargo and war. What we had during the War of 1812 and before the War of 1812, we had... Um, you know, America was unable to trade with people in the rest of the world, and so we had to develop our own economy. We had to be somewhat self-sufficient. And so Americans, the economy is going to grow as a result of this, and the population is going to grow, and people are going to be continuing to move out west. But also, just like England starts to go through an industrial revolution, 
America is going to start to go through their first industrial revolution. Because we couldn't trade with England during Jefferson's embargo or France, and then, of course, the Non-Intercourse Act, and then the War of 1812 and its blockade, like I said, America was forced to make its own goods, which means also a textile revolution. And so not only does England have a demand for uh, American cotton, but so does the North. And so putting more pressure on Southerners to move west um, and grow cotton to make huge profits. And so for all of these reasons, we see Americans moving west after the War of 1812. So here we see some pictures. Uh, so on the top right, we see what will be the National Road. And the National Road is going to start from Cumberland in Virginia, and it's going to continue to go west throughout this time period. You see these all these towns, and we just continue to build the road as a, as a federal government project. Um, and that's going to make it easier for people to move west on these, what you see in the bottom, these corduroy roads. Um, these are roads that uh, are made a little bit more permanent. They're just not a, a dirt road in the springtime and the winter, a mud track. Um, as we lay uh, logs down across the road, and so they have a tougher time sinking into the, into the mud. And so we have an all-weather road, although it's very bumpy, as you can imagine. Um, these people moving west, we're going to see this idea of the independent... American farmer, the rugged individualism, as is a well-known phrase, that America is composed of, of farmers who move out west and on their own, they you know chop down some trees, they build a cabin, they settle the land, they're self-sufficient, it's just ma and pa and all their kids for labor on the farm, and it's this American ideal that Americans don't need anybody, we don't need a government, we don't need anything, we can just make it on our own. And to some extent that's true, but a lot of these farmers, they did have to depend on trading with the East. They needed to get their iron tools, they needed to sell their crops to market, um, and so we see that there is some market individualism, but it's, not a, it's, it's somewhat of a myth. Americans did have to depend on the East and the rest of the country to get some of the goods they needed to survive. So as we move out west, we see all of these new states pop up. We have Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, we have Indiana and Illinois. And then we see this state called Missouri. Now, Missouri is going to apply for statehood in 1819. It has enough white male citizens to apply to go from territory status to, st to state status. But the problem is, is Missouri going to be a free state or a slave state? Is it going to allow slavery or not? Um, and we don't know. Uh, all previous compromises dealt with stuff that doesn't deal with the Louisiana Purchase. Let me give you an example. Right after the American Revolution started, if you recall, northern states north of the Mason-Dixon line, which is the line between Pennsylvania and Maryland, that is a line that more or less marks an unofficial boundary between north and south. I mean, it is an official boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland, but... We see that north of that line, it's a little bit too cold. This growing season is too short to grow cash crops, so hence no need for the slavery. South of that line, from Maryland down, we see that the growing season is long enough, and so cash crops, which means slavery. And so right after the Revolution, the states north of the Mason-Dixon line started to pass abolition laws, um, and the, the states south of that did not, because they depend on slavery for growing crops. And then we see under the Articles of Confederation, we made the Northwest Ordinance, and it says anything north of the Ohio River is going to be free, and everything south of it is going to be slave. And so we see that reflected on the map. The northern border of Kentucky um, and the western border of Virginia, more or less, is the Ohio River Valley, is the Ohio River. And so we see that those states, when they came into the Union, followed that border drawn by Congress. But Missouri is in Louisiana Purchase Territory, and the Ohio River ends at the Missouri border. It's where it joins uh, the Mississippi. And so Missouri is not going to be affected by the Northwest Ordinance. So what is it? Is it free or slave? We haven't decided yet. And a lot of people moved into Missouri from Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and so they didn't bring slaves with them. But an even greater number of people moved into Missouri because it has a very humid climate. You can grow cash crops from Kentucky and Tennessee and Virginia and Alabama and Mississippi, and they brought their slaves with them. And so here we see Missouri doesn't apply. It doesn't... Whether the question Missouri be free or slave is not really answered by previous agreements, so we have to figure out what we're going to do with Missouri when it applies for statehood. In addition to that, we have this concept that I've talked about in the past, this growing idea of sectionalism. That as America grows and its economy grows and its population gets bigger and its size gets bigger, 
we're going to see three distinct sections of America. We have the North, which is going to be increasingly more industrial. We have the South, which is heavily dependent on cash crop farming and slavery. And then we have the West, um, which is very farm oriented, but will the West be free or slave? And we don't know. And this problem keeps coming up and it'll come up again and again and again the first time here in Missouri, but it'll eventually be, of course, a major cause for the Civil War starting in 1861. Now, as we add states out west, what I mean by sectional balance is that the north and the south will add states typically in pairs. And so in the Senate, it's going to be an even amount of slave states and an even amount of free states. Um, and so nobody can really make a decision on slavery because if the north wants to outlaw it for America, which they don't, but if they, let's say they want to outlaw it for all of America, um, the South wouldn't let them do it because it can't get past the Senate and vice versa. And so we know this, and so we typically tend to add states in pairs to maintain sectional balance in the Senate. So as we're debating whether Missouri should become a state or not, a slave state or free state, we have this thing called the Talmadge Amendment that comes up in Congress. Try to seeking a compromise to this because this becomes a real crisis. If Missouri becomes a slave state, then the South has the upper hand in the Senate. And the North feels that, oh my goodness, maybe they can control the government then. Typically, presidents have been from the South, so they control the executive branch. And now we see that um, the South is going to control the upper house of Congress as well. And this makes Northerners nervous. It's not because most Northerners are abolitionists. In fact, they aren't, and most of them never will be. It's the fact that we are limiting the ability of farmers from the North to get land out West. Now, see if you can follow this. If I'm a Northern farmer in Illinois or Indiana or Ohio, there's always this insatiable demand for more land out west. As we build roads, we get more immigrants, we want to make more money, and the land out west is cheap. And so I want to be able to move out west with my family, let's say to Missouri, and buy a farm and start my lifestyle. But I can't do that if it's going to be a state that allows slavery, because rich plantation owners will move out west and they'll buy up all the land. And so that's the real concern for farmers out west, for northern farmers out west. If we let western territories become slave states, then the, the middle class northern farmer or lower upper class uh, northern farmer is going to get squeezed out. He's not going to be able to buy the land out west because it's already been purchased by a bunch of rich southern land speculators or plantation owners. And so it's not really about slavery, but it's about opportunity for most northern farmers. And so they are very anxious about Missouri becoming a slave state. And so the Talmadge Amendment is created. It says that Missouri will be a slave state in the short run. But no, but once it becomes a slave state, not a territory, no new slaves can be imported. And so eventually Missouri over the long run will be a free state because once the slaves that are currently there die out, no new slaves can be imported. Um, and then also slaves that reach a certain age that were born after the, uh, the admission of Missouri as a slave state, once they reach a certain age, they'll be set free with gradual emancipation. And so we see that eventually in the long run, Missouri would be a free state. And so this was trying to be a compromise. Slave states, you're going to get Missouri in the short run, but it'll eventually in the long run be um, a free state. Of course, this is going to go down to failure. <laughs> the South is like, we're not stupid. Uh, we, we don't want to just win in the short run. We want to have more land open to us in the long run. Plus, we want to be able to control the Senate with Missouri permanently being a slave state. And so the Talmadge Amendment is an attempted compromise that fails. And so we seem to be getting a crisis mode here. What are we going to do? Um, we, this is the first time we really see the northern states and the southern states really since the Constitutional Convention start to have it out about slavery. And so just in the nick of time we see um, our good friend Henry Clay from Kentucky. We met him at the beginning of the War of 1812. He comes in with the famous Missouri Compromise. It's going to hopefully make both sides happy north and south. So what it is, is Henry Clay and his supporters realized that in the past we were able to avoid conflict between the North and the South by drawing a line, whether it's the Mason-Dixon line or the Northwest Ordinance. So let's draw a line again. And so part of the Missouri Compromise says is that Missouri is going to become in as a uh, slave state. But then for the rest of the Louisiana Purchase, all of that land up there that was not part of the Northwest Ordinance, what we're going to do is we're going to divide and draw a line, and you can see it here. It's the 3630 line. It goes from the southern part of Missouri all the way to the very edge of the Louisiana Purchase in a straight line going west. And all the territories that will come in and eventually become states will be free north of that line, and all the ones south of it will be slave south of that line. 
And so we're dividing America up, and that seems to be fair. Now, if you notice, that's not a lot of land for the South, but they are fully expecting to get more land further south in the future, and you know that's a future problem, so we'll deal with that. So we're drawing a line, but this doesn't. And so that deals with what to do with Louisiana territory: north of the line, free; south of the line, slave. Wonderful. Missouri comes in as a slave state, but the North is a little upset about this compromise because they say, well, what about the sectional balance in the Senate? We don't want the South to have too much power in the Senate. And so Henry Clay comes up with, well, we'll continue to bring states in as pairs. And so Maine will split off from Massachusetts, which they've long wanted, and they'll be their own state. And of course, they'll be a free state being so far North. And so we maintain sectional balance in the Senate, one slave state, one free state. And we have now hopefully ended any kind of future controversy over slavery in the West by drawing a line and saying if you're north of this line you're going to be free and if you're south of this line you're going to be slave and so we've put that issue of slavery to bed we hope. The next thing is we're going to move away from the idea of the West and slavery and we're going to move kind of shift gears to what's going on in the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court is still headed by uh, John Marshall and he is you remember as a Federalist judge. Now even though the Federalist Party has disintegrated. Their ideas live on through the judicial branch, especially the Supreme Court and John Marshall. Now, we're going to cover several court cases here, but they all have two things for the most part that there's, that's their goal. One is the idea of strengthening the federal government, which if you remember, um, when the Federalist Party first started, was a major component of their uh, belief system, have a strong federal government. And the reason for that is because we want America to be strong and effective, and we want the federal government to be able to promote business. So that's the second goal of a lot of these court cases, is to favor business and protect business and promote business, because the Federalists and John Marshall want America to be an industrial country, an urban country, and we can only do that if we have business. So let's take a look at this. We have the case of McCulloch versus Maryland in 1819. And what happens is, if you remember, the Federalists, a key part of Hamilton's plan for America was to have a national bank. National banks have, a, this national bank will have a lot of money, and then businessmen can go to it and create even more big businesses by getting loans. And this will help stimulate the economy and turn America into that Federalist dream of an industrial America. So the National Bank exists, and they have all these branch, these branch banks across America, and one of them is in Maryland. And so we see that the state of Maryland, which is led by Democratic Republicans, they do not like this leftover of the Federalist Party, the National Bank in their state, a branch of the National Bank in their state. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to get rid of this, this branch of the National Bank in their state. Um, and so they say what they do is they try to tax the bank. The state of Maryland says, look, if you want to, uh, if, to the people of Maryland, if you want to you know, do your business with the National Bank branch in Maryland, that's fine, but we're going to tax those transactions. And so if we allow the state of Maryland to tax the National Bank in Maryland, that'll give it a competitive disadvantage to other more local banks in Maryland, and it'll kill the bank in Maryland. And if other states do this, it'll kill the bank there too. And that was what Maryland was hoping for, is that they want to have banks, yes, banks, because you need banks, but at a local level, because they feel it's more democratic. If I'm a Democratic Republican, I don't like the national bank because it gives power to the elites, and it's headquartered way up in the north, um, and it's not going to be locally headquartered. And so I want local banks. right? If I owe money to my local mom-and-pop bank in my hometown, well, it's run by the people in my town, and so I see them at church, and I do business with them, and if I need an extension on my loan, maybe they'll give it to me. So local banks seem more democratic and under the control of the people than the national bank does, which is in some far-off city, um, you know, it's in New York or, or whatever, and so we see that people think that the national bank is undemocratic, so let's tax it, let's kill it through taxing it. And so we see this court case go from Maryland, basically Maryland versus McCullough for the National Bank, and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And of course, Marshall has the power of judicial review, and the Supreme Court says that you cannot tax the bank, and it is constitutional, because the elastic clause. Even though it doesn't say it in the Constitution, the National Bank is constitutional because the elastic clause that says Congress has the power to do anything necessary and proper and so he says that the National Bank is necessary and it is proper. And so we see this as a victory as we rule in favor of the National Bank. Um, we, uh, we see that we are strengthening business in America and we're also strengthening the federal government because the federal government has just told the state what they can and cannot do. Federal government reigns supreme over states. 
It also says that the concept of loose construction is valid. Remember we talked about this, that there are two ways to interpret the Constitution. You can look at the elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause, and say, well, Congress will do anything that's needed, which gives the government more power. That's loose construction. We loosely interpret the Constitution. And then, of course, we had strict construction, which is Amendment 10 of the Constitution, says the government can only do what specifically is said. We're going to strictly interpret the Constitution. And so this seems to be a victory for the idea of loose construction in America. The next case we have is Dartmouth College versus Woodward, also in 1819. So it's in the state of New Hampshire. And we see that New Hampshire wants the university to become a public institution. Um, it's a private school. And so what they do is they rip up the charter of Dartmouth College. The charter means it, it, it's a business plan, basically. It says that it can exist as a private institution. And what we're going to do is we're going to rip up that charter and say to the Dartmouth College, you have to reapply for your charter to the state of New Hampshire because your charter was issued when we were colonies. Well, we don't have colonial government anymore, and the king isn't our ruler, and so you're going to have to reapply. And so that's their legitimacy. That's their reason for saying you need to reapply. But of course, this case goes to the Supreme Court um, because Dartmouth College doesn't want to give up their charter. They like the way things are. Thank you very much. And so we see this court case um, uh, between basically Dartmouth College and the, the government of New Hampshire, more or less. And so John Marshall rules on this, judicial review, and he says that Dartmouth College, he rules in favor of Dartmouth College. He says it doesn't matter who Dartmouth College signed their charter with. The charter is a contract. It's a business contract. And it doesn't matter who they signed it with. It is sacred. Contracts are permanent. And so this is going to promote business in America. I mean, think if we didn't have this. Let's say anybody could just rip up a contract anytime they want. I have somebody come and I, I sign a contract with them that they're going to paint my house. And I say, okay, paint my house and I'll pay you when it's done. That's our contract. So the people paint our house, the business paints our house. When it's done, they come to me and they say, okay, we've done the work. We want to get it paid. Again, then I could just rip up the contract and say, no, I don't think so. I'm ripping up the contract. Now, nobody could do business in that kind of an environment. And so by saying that contracts are sacred, this is protecting business and hopefully allowing it to grow even more. Again, a Federalist dream for when the party existed. Next, we have 1821, a couple years later, we have the court case of Cohen's versus Virginia. And so we have the Cohen's family, and they were illegally selling lottery tickets in the state of Virginia without a license. Now, this doesn't seem like it would be very much of something to involve the Supreme Court. Um, the state of Virginia gave people a license to sell uh, uh, state lottery tickets, and the Cohen's family was selling them without the license. Um, and so we see that the, the Virginia court rules in favor of the state. Big surprise. They're going to support the state. And so the Cohen's family says this isn't right. And so the Supreme Court takes the case judicial review. And that right there is important. It doesn't really matter how we rule on this case. It's setting the precedent that the Supreme Court has the power to rule on state court cases. In other words, it says the Supreme Court is superior to state courts, um, and they are the final say. And so it doesn't matter if we rule for Cohen's or if we rule for Virginia. It really doesn't matter. It's the idea that the Supreme Court has the power to take that case and decide and is the final arbiter. And so this certainly gives the federal government more power, a federalist idea, and it says the Supreme Court is above the state courts and the Supreme Court of the law, of the law of the land. Next, we have Gibbons versus Ogden, 1824. And so in this case, we see that the state of New York passes a law. It says that um, a certain family uh, can have, a certain business can have a monopoly over uh, tr uh, ferry traffic from New Jersey to New York. And so if you live in New Jersey, the only way you can send, you can have a ferry traffic or send goods or people to New York, the state of New York, is if the state of New York gives you that license. And otherwise, you're breaking the law. And, of course, uh, this involves more than one state. And so um, the legislature says, of New York says we can do this. And, of course, uh, we're going to have a company say that, well, this, all the other companies say this isn't fair. The state of, if I'm a company in New Jersey, why can, a state, why can the state legislature of New York pass a law saying that I can't trade with New York? This seems to be a violation of the Commerce Clause. And so, of course, there's a lawsuit. And Marshall takes the case, and he says that only the federal government can regulate interstate trade. Uh, they can't, of course, by the Constitution, regulate trade that goes on only in, inside a state, intrastate trade. But if there's trade, if there's trade disputes that go on between New Jersey and New York, or today Colorado, Wyoming, whatever, that 
that right is reserved for the federal government, not the states. And so, okay, well, what does this mean for the Constitution, though? This means that now the, the Supreme Court of the United States and Congress have the power to supersede state law, that they, they are the final say, that even if the state passes a law, it doesn't matter if that law involves that state in another state, Congress and the Supreme Court is the final authority, elevating the power of the federal government over the power of states, which of course, once again, we see was a federalist ideology from back when they were a party. So all of these court, court cases do one of two things. They either protect business or they protect and promote the power of the federal government over the states. So now let's shift gears again and let's move to foreign policy during the presidency of Monroe. And this is really all about securing America's borders. We have added a lot of territory out west, um, but where does, that, where does that border end? I mean, when we added Louisiana Purchase, okay, it's going to encompass everything that drains into the Mississippi River. So from the Mississippi River to the Continental Divide, all of that will drain into the Mississippi, and so that's all technically a part of Louisiana. But where is the northern boundary of that? We don't know. How far north into British Canada does it go? And so we have border disputes between us and British Canada. And these are starting to get serious. As people start to move out west, this becomes more of an issue. And so we start to rattle the saber a little bit. Us and the British start to get angry. And we don't want a third war with the British. And so what we do is we sign the Convention of 1818, which basically we're going to draw a straight line from the Lake of the Woods straight west at the 49th parallel all the way to the Rocky Mountains. That straight line is a very easy border and so now we know exactly where the Louisiana Purchase ends and we won't have border disputes and we won't have war with Great Britain. Now it doesn't go into the Oregon country um, because that's on the other side of the Rocky Mountains um, and so what we decide is that we will jointly occupy the northwest part of America which is now Oregon and Washington um, and it's not an issue. We don't have to figure out where the line is now because there just aren't enough white people out there whether they're British or Canadians or Americans to worry about this so we'll just for now send it off to another generation to worry about and so we're trying to secure that northern border. Next, what do we do about Florida? Now, Florida is a Spanish territory still, and we're having problems with the border of Florida. Because if you're a slave in the Carolinas or Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia, you know that you just have to go south a little bit and get into Spanish Florida and you're free. And so we see that this was a problem for slave owners in the south, is they were losing slaves, they were running away, and they were able to get to freedom in Spanish Florida. In addition to that, some of the slaves were running away and living with Native Americans in the swamps of Florida, in the backcountry of Florida, and they were combining to create what we call the Seminole Indians. Um, and then they were launching attacks across the border to free their relatives. And so if you're a slave owner in, in, let's say, Georgia, this is a problem. Slaves are now running away, and that's property for you, that's money. In addition to that, you're being attacked from across the border, and if you were to attack back, that would be an act of war. And so they want the federal government to do something about this. And so we see that one of the Native Americans who is leading this, this, the, the Seminole Indians across the border and making raids is Chief Osceola. And, and he is leading some of the this combination of Native Americans, Seminole Indians, and African Americans across the border, launching raids, harassing um, plantation owners, and also freeing more slaves. So to deal with this, James Monroe was going to send, of course, our famous general from the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson. And he has given explicit instructions. You are to go into Spanish Florida, even though this is an act of war, you are to go into Spanish Florida... Um, and you're going to capture, recapture those slaves and kill Native Americans that are encouraging these border crossings. But he is sp told specifically not to attack any Spanish fortifications because that would be an act of war and America does not want another war. So we're trying to secure the border between us and Spanish Florida, make it um, so that it's, we don't have these problems with the Spanish. Of course, Andrew Jackson will go a little bit beyond his, his mandate, and he will actually abduct a couple of Spanish officials, um, and so this will create even more friction with Spain, because not only did we invade their colony without their permission, but we also have abducted a couple of their, uh, of their citizens. And so Spain decides they have a decision to make. Do they want to go to war with us or not over this, over this slight? And of course, Spain can see the writing on the wall is that they know that the American population is growing by leaps and bounds. 
We're seeing that there's more and more people. We're expanding west. And they know that it's not going to be long until enough white Americans will move into Spanish Florida and we'll just take it away from Spain. We'll just have enough people on the ground that eventually Spain will lose Florida anyway. And so what they decide to do is they'll make a treaty with the United States. It's the Adams-Onus Treaty. John Quincy Adams is going to be the person who signs it for Monroe. Um, and the Adams-Onus Treaty is in 1819, and it basically it says that Spain is giving up control of Florida to the United States for reasons I already said. They know they can't hold on to it. But the United States has to make a promise. We have to promise that as we continue to move out west, we are not going to let our settlers move over from Louisiana into northern um, Mexico. Now, Mexico is still controlled by the Spanish at this point, and they're very nervous that as we continue to move west and gobble up more land, that um, we're eventually going to take northern Mexico away from the Spanish Empire. And so we have to make this promise at the adams Onus Treaty. They'll give us Florida, but they don't want us to take what will be Texas from them. Of course, we will take Texas in the future, but it won't be from Spain. It'll be from Mexico when they're an independent country. So we technically don't violate this treaty, although we can see it coming. So um, here's again, before we move on, another example of how the presidency of Monroe is now trying to settle the southern border. And so the Convention of 1818, the Treaty of 1818, is settling the northern border with British Canada. And here we are settling the southern border with Spanish Florida and, of course, also out west. Then we get the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. So the Napoleonic Wars... When they were going on during previous presidencies, they had, it had weakened Spanish control of the New World. Um, if I'm a Spanish colonial in uh, Argentina or Chile or in the Caribbean or even eventually in Mexico, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the Napoleonic Wars going on in Europe when Spain is distracted and conquered and they cannot hold on to their colonies in the New World. And so right after the Napoleonic Wars, we're going to see a whole bunch of Latin American countries get their independence. Spain is weakened from the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, and they can't send an army over to stop these rebellions. And so, of course, this is the time we see Simón Bolívar um, and a bunch of Latin American countries gain their independence. And Spain loses most of its New World possessions. Now, these new Latin American countries are fledgling democracies. Um, or we at least hope they are. Um, and so we pass the Monroe Doctrine that basically says to Spain, once the Napoleonic Wars are over, that you can't come back and get your colonies. We want, we want this to be a Europe-free zone. And that's what the Monroe Doctrine says. It says that any European countries, this is a hands-off zone. You cannot come back and reestablish your control over colonies in the Western Hemisphere. If you have colonies and didn't lose them, fine. That's okay, but if you lost the colonies, you cannot come back and get them. We want Europe to be on their side of the Atlantic. We don't like Europe. We fought wars with Europe. Um, and so we want this to be a Europe-free zone. Plus, we want to encourage these democratic countries to grow in our southern borders. We figure that we're a democracy. They're a democracy. Um, we got rid of a, of a king in Europe. They got rid of a king in Europe. So there are hermanos, right? There are brothers. And we want to develop good relationships with them and have a secure border on the south where we're not having any rivalries in the Americas. And so we see that this is the reasons for the Monroe Doctrine. So uh, in addition to that, the other half of this, which is usually forgotten, is we say not only do we expect Europe to stay out of the Americas, but we make a pledge that the United States will stay out of European problems as well. Um, you stay on your side of the planet, we'll stay on our side of the planet. And so those are the two parts of the Monroe Doctrine, Europe out of the Western Hemisphere, we will stay out of the Eastern Hemisphere. Now when we issue this doctrine, Europe kind of laughs at it a little bit. Because, you know, who is this new country on the United States of America to tell us that we can't get our colonies back? We know they don't have a big military. We know they don't have a big navy or an army. And so Spain kind of laughs at this, and France kind of laughs at this. They're like, we are going to get our colonies back. But England doesn't want um, them to get their colonies back either. Because what happens is when... Um, Spain lost a lot of its New World colonies. England saw this as an opportunity, just like the United States. You see, we couldn't trade with a lot of Latin America because of mercantilism, right, or mercantilism. This was a Spanish colony, and they only wanted their colonies to benefit mother, to Mother Spain. And so when we see these Spanish colonies become new Latin American countries, not only do we want them to stay independent for all the reasons I mentioned, but we now see new markets. We see new raw materials that we can get. We can now trade with these countries 
in the past we couldn't because they were part of the Spanish Empire, but now they're free and independent. We want to trade with them. But it's the same thing for the British. Remember, the British are starting their Industrial Revolution, and they see all of these raw materials that they couldn't get that they can now get because they're independent countries. And they see all of these markets that they could sell to, just like the United States believes this. And so it's in England's interest as well as America's interest to keep these countries independent. And so while we issue the Monroe Doctrine, we have no way of enforcing it. But the British are going to enforce it for us, for us, because it's in their interest to enforce it. And so the British Navy will start patrolling um, the Atlantic Ocean. And even though they're not doing this for us, the British fleet will enforce the Monroe Doctrine, not to make us happy, but just to make their own country happy and give them um, access to these Spanish, these former Spanish colonial ports, now independent ports. So that ends our Monroe Doctrine. Uh, sorry, that ends on our Monroe uh, notes.